Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, a French court rules that the Rwandan man accused of having bankrolled the country's genocide can be transferred to a UN tribunal to stand trial. Felix Kabuga was arrested near Paris earlier this year after 25 years on the run. Also, Cameroon's accused of becoming increasingly repressive after hundreds of opposition members remain in jail following their arrest at anti-government protests last week. And several people appear in court in Paris after trying to take African artwork from a museum in the French capital. The activists say that they were trying to make a point about how much African heritage was removed from the continent under colonialism. But first, France's top appeals court has ruled that Rwandan genocide suspect Felicia Kabuga can be handed over to a United Nations tribunal for trial. He was arrested near Paris in May after 25 years on the run. Ellen Gainsford has more. Four and a half months after his arrest, France's top appeals court has ruled Felicien Kabuga will be handed over to the UN to face justice. The Rwandan genocide suspect was tracked down to a flat outside Paris in May. He had been on the run for 26 years, with a $5 million US bounty on his head. Shortly after his arrest, UN war crimes investigators requested that he be handed over to international judges. It is uh, an arrest warrant and an indictment coming from the, the UN mechanism. So we are the, uh, the competent uh, jurisdiction to, 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 tr to deal with this case. Lawyers for Kabuga, now in his 80s, had asked for a trial in France, citing his frail health. But the court ruled there was no legal or medical obstacle to prevent his transfer to Arusha in Tanzania, where the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda is trying outstanding cases. Responding to the verdict, Kabuga's team are now requesting his case be transferred to The Hague. Families of genocide victims want him brought to justice without delay. Most of the witnesses are old. More and more, they're dying of old age. If we have one main wish, it's for Kabuga to go on trial in Rwanda, because that's where he committed his crimes. It's important that justice is carried out at the scene of the crime. Kabuga faces seven counts of war crimes for his role in the mass killings. He's accused of bankrolling and arming Houthi extremists. He also funded the notorious Radio Television Libre des Mille Collines, which incited hatred and murder of ethnic Tutsis. Around 800,000 people were slaughtered in Rwanda in just a hundred days. The World Health Organization will investigate allegations of sexual abuse by Ebola aid workers in DR Congo. Around 50 women say that they were ambushed in hospitals and forced to have sex, often in exchange for jobs. Clément Bonero brings us more. The allegations brought against Ebola aid workers cover the period between 2018 and March this year, when the DRC was battling its 10th and so far deadliest Ebola outbreak in the east of the country. The new humanitarian and the Thomson Reuters Foundation spoke to 50 women who said they were sexually abused by men, including doctors who claimed to be from the World Health Organization, the Congolese Health Ministry, as well as several NGOs. Some of those women were reportedly ambushed in hospitals and two of them became pregnant. Philip Kleinfeld from the New Humanitarian explained to me how these men were able to force so many women into having sex. This was a response where there was a lot of money pumped into a relatively small uh, part of the country in a job scarce region uh, and there was uh, the recruitment of thousands of, uh, of locals. Um, Women, uh, a lot of a lot of local women would apply for jobs as as cleaners, or as cooks, or in community outreach positions. And uh, men, the members of aid agencies, would uh, exploit their relative poverty and their need for jobs, uh, and that's how they would lure them into these sex for work schemes. In a statement on Tuesday, the WHO said the allegations would be, I quote, robustly investigated, adding that anyone involved would face serious consequences, including immediate dismissal. Meanwhile, DR Congo's health minister said he'd received no reports of such abuse. However, he said he would personally take care of any cases brought to his attention. Clément Bonero there for us. 
Now in Cameroon, more than 500 opposition supporters are still detained after their arrest at anti-government protest last Tuesday. Critics accuse President Paul Bia's administration of growing increasingly intolerant of dissent. Our correspondents report. Government threats to dissolve Professor Mori's Camptos MRC party make headlines across Cameroon. Security forces have surrounded the opposition leader's home in Douala for over a week. President Paul Bia's main opponent denounces what he calls a de facto house arrest. I am locked up without any legal grounds because it's not known if I am under de facto house arrest or if I am kidnapped or if it's another law in Cameroon that I do not know about yet. After our request for comment, the Cameroonian government sent us this statement accusing Maurice Campto of calling for an uprising and destabilizing the country. The document says his case will be carefully examined by judicial authorities. Hundreds of arrested MRC supporters are still waiting for their cases to be heard. Among them, the party's spokesperson and treasurer. Le repérage de tous ces personnes embastillées se poursuit. The party's lawyer says these detentions were foreseeable. Barrister Michel Ndoki was arrested in January 2019. That year, more than 300 MRC members spent months in prison without knowing their fate. She's worried about last week's crackdown on peaceful anti-government rallies. We're talking about some 600 people arrested, many even before the demonstration and many after it. We're heading into new dark days. The tense political climate in Cameroon shows little sign of improving. Local and international human rights organizations continue to accuse the country of repression of fundamental public freedoms. Now, the UN's call to countries to fund an international vaccine plan. Fair distribution of coronavirus vaccines is key to global economic recovery. The world can't afford to edge out poorer nations in the race to secure licensed vaccines. Vaccine affordability is a big issue in Africa. Nevertheless, the continent has made encouraging progress in tackling the spread of COVID-19 so far. A quick update from our correspondents in South Africa, Nigeria and Kenya. South Africa has recorded another 81 COVID-19 deaths and 903 new infections in the past day. This comes as the country is preparing this week to reopen its borders for international travel for the first time in six months. Now that is part of a move to revive the economy after we learned yesterday that 2.2 million jobs were lost during lockdown. And it should restore a semblance of normality to the country, even though we remained under a nighttime curfew and there's still restrictions in place on gatherings. Crucially though, the peak of the pandemic is more than a month past and the recovery rate has now reached 90 percent. But there's been a fresh warning from the Minister of Health that there's a very real risk of a second wave and that it could potentially be more deadly than the first, which has killed almost 17,000 people. And he warned that should this happen, the country will have no choice but to return to hard lockdown conditions once again. Life is generally returning to normal in Nigeria. People are living their lives as if there's no COVID-19 pandemic. Schools, churches, mosques, airports, markets, and other places that were closed down in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic have reopened. Nigeria has witnessed a dramatic drop in COVID-19 cases. The country reached a peak of 800 cases a day in July. Now, cases have reduced to about 150 cases a day. Isolation centers are being closed down because there are no longer patients. Of a population of 200 million, Nigeria recorded less than 60,000 COVID-19 cases. Now people are saying that it seems there's no COVID-19 cases in Nigeria. Protocols are not being respected. People are not wearing masks. They are not maintaining social distances. But authorities have warned that this has a danger because COVID-19 is very much around with us. COVID-19 cases reported in Kenya have been declining steadily since August. Fewer than 40,000 cases have been recorded and fewer than 800 deaths. Official numbers are also low in other countries in the region. There is much less testing here than in other wealthier countries. However, there is no sign of a public health crisis. 
So for instance, cemeteries and hospitals are not overwhelmed. President Uhuru Kenyatta has announced a relaxation of COVID-19 restrictions. So now the nighttime curfew um, now begins two hours later at 11 o'clock in the evening. Bars have been allowed to reopen and religious gatherings can seat up to a third of their capacity. The president, however, warned of the possibility of a second wave, even though there is no sign of one yet. MC Fahera, Samuel Okoya and Mukelwa Shachwayu were there for us. Now, five people were on trial in Paris on Wednesday for trying to take a 19th century African funeral staff from a museum in the city. The activists say that it was part of a campaign to try and pressure France to return more items of African heritage that were taken because of colonialism. Nicolas Schumer has more. A dozen people came to the Paris courthouse to support Congolese activist Imri Mwazulu Yabanza. Prosecutors on Wednesday asked for him to be fined 1,000 euros. In June, he had tried to seize a 19th century Chadian artwork from the Quai Museum in Paris. It was part of a campaign calling for France to give back to African countries the artworks it seized mostly during the colonial era. Quelqu'un peut-il vraiment nous démontrer noir sur blanc que ces œuvres-là appartiennent au musée du Quai alors que les rapports reconnaissent et que le président français de par lui-même reconnaît qu'il a volé à Ouagadougou, il a reconnu. Donc, euh, on voit aisément dans quel camp euh, les citoyens du monde doivent se trouver, parce que ce sont les valeurs de justice. Three years ago, in Burkina Faso, Emmanuel Macron had addressed the issue. Je ne peux pas accepter qu'une large part du patrimoine culturel de plusieurs pays africains soit en France. Il y a des explications historiques à cela, mais il n'y a pas de justification valable, durable et inconditionnelle. For now, France has said it will return a sword to Senegal and 26 objects to Benin that were taken by colonial troops in the 19th century. But lawyers for the Congolese activists say that's not nearly enough. According to a report commissioned by Macron, there are in all approximately 90,000 African works in French museums. Well, that's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us and do so again if you can. Take care.